hopelessness, joy in the midst of sorrow. We give praise and honor to our God. There is a word from the Lord today. It is found in the New Testament. The New Testament, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8 and beginning at verse 26. Allow me to read the text to you for we will deal with this text for a, at least a couple of weeks. Verse 26 of Acts says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, 
who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understandest thou what thou readest? He said, how can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, like a lamb dumb before his shearers. So opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? And the eunuch answered, Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip uh, was found in Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. I want to use as a thought for the morning, the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian. Let us pray. Father, open our eyes now that we can see, open our ears that we can hear, open up our hearts that we might be able to understand and receive what you have to say. All truth is your truth. Sometimes that truth is uncomfortable. But when we accept the truth, it shall make us free. God be the glory, great things he has done. Amen, amen, and amen. The Ethiopian. Beloved, most, if not all, of you are familiar with the controversy associated with the critical race theory debate. And the question is, what is critical race theory? Simply this, critical race theory is an academic discipline that claims that the United States, States was founded on racism, oppression, and white supremacy, and that these forces are still at the root of American society. Now, opponents of the critical race theory claim that the theory is flawed, and it teaches our children to hate their country. Certain politicians have made the critical race theory the boogeyman, passing laws to prohibit, prohibit it from being taught in our schools. Yeah. Well, what they seem not to know is that is not even being taught in the schools. Yeah. Critical race theory doesn't show up until you get into the collegiate and graduate levels. Yeah. Yet there are those who are saying, we're going to make our children hate their country if we teach them the truth. Yeah. Blood in a non-biased cursory examination of American history along with a fair observation of current racial attitudes and activities in this country would have to agree that critical race theory is not merely a theory, it is the truth. And we know what Jesus said about the truth. It will make you free. Yeah. Now, let me say something about history. The study of history is extremely important. It should never be taken lightly. It should never be discounted. Yeah. For one who fails to know his history is destined to repeat the failures of the past. It is just as important to make sure that the history that we study is accurate. In other words, the history we study must tell the truth for too long now. Just like much of American history, 
Much of the true history of the Bible has been misrepresented and ignored. Images of a paled face, blonde haired, blue eyed Jesus have dominated our consciousness for centuries. In fact, most of the images of the characters in the Bible have been misrepresented. Any cursory knowledge of geography and world history knows that these are clear misrepresentations of the scriptures. This should not be. The truth must be told. And when the truth is told, people of all nations, kindreds, and tongues can see themselves in the scriptures, which will motivate them now, that will motivate them all the more to become a member of the family of God. The Bible is a book of diversity. It is a book of color, magnificent color. Its stories and activities are centered in a region of the world replete with color. And as people of color, that should give us a sense of inclusiveness to know that people who look like us are part of God's story. Amen? Amen. This brings me to the story of the Ethiopian. I want to tell you this story in two parts today and the next time that we are together. I need this much time to adequately address the issues. I want you to know, first of all, that there are three movements to this narrative. I want us to see his story. I want to see us to see his search. And I want us to see his salvation. His story, his search, and his salvation. Look with me first at his story, and that's all we'll cover today. Verses 26 and 27 of the text introduce us to the character or the characters of the narrative. One of them is a fellow by the name of Philip. Yes. Philip was a respected member of the church in Jerusalem. Yes, he was one of the chosen seven to serve in the capacity of what many recognize as the first deacons at the church in Jerusalem. Yes. But Philip was more than that. He was one of the first missionaries. In fact, he is the first one to be called an evangelist in Acts 21 and verse 8. Acts 8 1 tells us that Philip went to preach down to the city of Samaria. And when he, along with others who were preaching in Samaria, were preparing to return to Jerusalem, verse 26 says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, Philip, and go down toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem in or unto Gaza. Now, the text suggests to us just how difficult the road of evangelism or the road of the missionary was. Verse 26 tells us that the road to Gaza was a desert road, a hot road, a, a difficult road uh, with scorpions and snakes. It was not, ministry is not always easy. You may not have to deal with scorpions and snakes, not the animal kind, but you'll always find scorpions and snakes in the church. They're there. So Philip journeyed down the road, and when he did, he encountered the second character in this story, who was the Ethiopian. Verse 27 gives us a good idea or good information or a good deal of information about this Ethiopian. It tells us that he was a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all of her treasure. This meant that he was like the minister of finance or the secretary of the treasury in the queen's court. That meant that he had to be a well-trained, skilled, and educated individual. They just didn't throw anybody in there with the money. He was a eunuch. Eunuchs were men who had been emasculated and typically installed into trusted positions of government. Eunuchs are seen throughout the scriptures in both the Old and New Testament. We see them uh, in the stories of Daniel and various other uh, monarchies and royal courts. Some have suggested the reason kings and queens installed eunuchs in their court was because they were unable to tamper with their concubines. Makes sense. 
Perhaps the thing that stands out most about this man's story is where he was from. He was from Ethiopia, and there's much fascinating history here. Although it is a struggling nation today, Ethiopia, during the time of Jesus and before, was a, was a wealthy and powerful nation. In fact, it was a world power. Therefore, Candace, which was more of a title than her name, the queen of Ethiopia, was one of the most powerful women in the world during this time. Ethiopia is also referred to in the Bible as the land of Cush. Cush is, the, is a grandson of Noah. Let me slow down here and make sure that we get this part of our history lesson. It's very important. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You see them in Genesis 10. Each were the progenitors of the races. Everybody came from one of these three guys. Shem is the father of the Semite race, the Arabian culture, the Middle East peoples. Japheth is the father of the Aryan or Caucasian or white race. Many settled in, in, the, in the European area. And Ham is the father of all dark-skinned people on the earth. Therefore, you are all descendants of Ham. Cush was one of the sons of Ham. Ham, as I said, is the progenitor of all the dark-skinned people. Therefore, Cush produced the Ethiopian people. And Ethiopian means black or burnt skin. From the very beginning of Scripture, Cush, or Ethiopia, is presented prominently and often. Uh, there's a passage in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 13, 23, which says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopards his spots? Uh, there was clearly a, a recognition of the skin color of the Ethiopians, and we see them time and time again throughout the scriptures. Now, Ethiopia is a North African nation. I'm giving you this information because I do want you to see something here. A North African nation just south of Egypt. And here is something that many people do not know. North Africa was once the center or the hub of Christian theology. Let me say that again. N North Africa, not Greece, not Rome, not Britain, not Scandinavia, not Dallas, Texas, but Northern Africa was the center of Christian theology, the hub. Now, let me give you a little more history on North Africa. Now, most Christians associate the early church in the regions of Greece and Rome, right? Ah, but the book of Acts tells us a different story. Sheds a little more light about this region, and what we will discover is that North Africa was a major, major area for Christianity. Acts chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that on Pentecost, it says that Egyptians and Libyans from around Cyrene, which are all along the North African coastline, heard the gospel in their own language, Acts 2.8. And what did they do when they heard the gospel? They took it back to their North African communities, thus spreading Christianity throughout North Africa. The thriving church at Antioch, men like Niger, yes, the name means exactly what it says, Niger, and Barnabas and Paul, who sailed to Cyprus and Cyrene, both North African nations, to share God's word with the congregations there, according to Acts 13. Each of these glimpses provide clues to the transformational spread of Christianity across North Africa. Anybody who suggests that African folk don't know about the Lord Jesus, we were one of the first to tell the story. You see, knowing the history of the region can help us. It can help and encourage us 
as we pray and minister to the people who live in that area today. That area is predominantly Muslim. And you ask, Reverend, what happened to the North African Christian church? The Muslims decimated it. Here is something else. North Africa is the home of many of the church fathers. Church fathers were, were the bridge that bridged the gap between the first century and the second, third, and fourth century. Many of them were actually alive during the time of the apostles. And when I studied, and I was at Dallas Seminary, I discovered that all of the church fathers were white. At least that's what they told me. All the images of them were pink, long, strangly hair, until we began to study just a little more. Tertullian was one of my favorite. You say, who is Tertullian? T Tertullian was born in Carthage, now found in Tunisia. That's North Africa. He was one of the earliest writers of the Latin Christian literature. And perhaps the big thing about Tertullian is that he coined a very important term. He coined the term the Trinity. Yeah. Tertullian now, wasn't from Sweden, wasn't for Fra from Frankfurt, yeah. North Africa, Tunisia. Yes, he was. Origen, another church father, Origen, born in Alexandria, Egypt, was the first th theologian to develop systematic Christian doctrine. You may not realize just how big a deal that is because in every, in every seminary, in every Christian college, everybody is required to take systematic theology. And guess who developed it? A man from North Africa. Not Sweden! Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, another North African city, was a notable early Christian. And then here's the big dog, the one, the sunum bonum, the one I like more than all of them. His name is St. Augustine. Yeah, yeah. yeah St. Augustine was a brother. Yeah. St. Augustine of Hippo, born in what is now Algeria, North Africa. He may have been the most influential scholar and philosopher of the Christian church. It was he who penned the famous serenity prayer. You know it, which says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and what? The wisdom to know the difference. Yeah, yeah. That came from brother man, St. Augustine. Yeah, Many of the councils of North Africa helped to frame the Bible that we have now from Genesis to Revelation, you know where that came from? North Africa. I just wanted to give you some of this very important history and information about where this brother, the Ethiopian, was coming from. And we return again during the travels of the Apostle Philip. It led him to this Ethiopian eunuch, and he led him to Christ in Acts 8. And it is believed that just like all the other North African residents, this eunuch took his faith in Christ back to Ethiopia with him. All of these individuals helped to establish the church, one of the greatest churches of all time in North Africa, once the hub of Christian theology. Not Greece, not Rome. I like that when Richard Burton would go Rome. Not Britain, but North Africa. In fact, every, every legitimate historian and anthropologist will agree that the cradle of civilization is North Africa. I was taught, Deke, when I was in first grade, that everybody was born in Europe. And we got dark when we start moving closer to the earth, the equator down in Africa. It's the other way around. We started in North Africa and moved north to Europe. They came late. But they ain't going to tell you that. That might get into the critical race theory. And lo and behold, it'll make them hate America. <laughs> Beloved, I stopped by to tell you that God has a plan. 
And the power by which he carries out that plan is the Holy Spirit. Verse 29 of the text says, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Philip, go up and join the chariot. Go up, Philip, and talk to the Ethiopian and tell him my story. Tell him that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Tell him that, Philip. Tell him that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Ain't God all right? Tell him that, Philip. Tell him that the man that he is reading about in the book of Isaiah in that chariot is a man named Jesus. Tell him that Jesus came to earth on the train of time, stopped off at Bethlehem was born in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, came a time to teach, a time to preach, and then ultimately it came his time to die. And die he did. He died until the sun refused to give its light. He died until the moon took a judgment hemorrhage and dripped away in blood. He died until dead bodies got up out of the grave and walked around town. He died until the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. He died, but after a while, he stopped dying. And then early Sunday morning, he stood up on resurrection ground and declared that all power in heaven and in earth was in his hand. I heard the gospel writer say, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? He swallowed up, swallowed up in the hands of Jesus Christ. Tell him that, Philip. Tell him that Jesus loves diversity. Tell him that Jesus loves all the little children, all the little children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white, all are precious in his sight. Tell him that, Philip. Then tell him that there's room at the cross. Yes, there's plenty of room. Though millions have come, there's still room for even one more. Go tell him that, Philip. Romans have come, Jews have come, but tell the Ethiopian that it is his time to come. Yeah. Beloved, I just simply stopped by to tell you that we have a rich history, a long and valued history. This book that we read and we study that has been attacked by Muslims and Jews alike, it contains some of the most richest history of all mankind. And we are sitting right there in the midst of it. So be proud of who you are. Recognize that color is something that God loves. Who wants an all-white garden? We want a garden with black and red and yellow and green. They're a whole lot more prettier than just plain old right. But we're living in a world now that there are those who are afraid, who want to block and keep others who are not like them. We got to stop them from voting. We got to stop them from doing this. We got to keep them out of here and keep them out of that because we want America for ourselves. That ain't how God wants this thing. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He has is, he is vanquished out the vintage of his terrible Swiss sword. Glory, glory. His truth, not my truth. His truth, not any of the Republican senators' truth, but God's truth is marching on. A lie cannot live forever. Truth crushed to earth will rise again. Let us pray. Father God, all truth is your truth. So let the whole truth and nothing but the truth be told. Let it be told in the state house. Tell it in the school house. Tell it in the church house. Let it be told in our house. Let it be told like Philip told the eunuch. And when the truth is told, then we'll be able to say, like the words of that old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Yeah.
Amen. Come praise to you. Just wanna